Hello traders, it's Saturday, September the 9th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you a weekend wrap-up for this past trading week, and more importantly, an outlook for what next week holds. Well, if we were looking at the open of the week following the extended holiday uh, in the United States that carried us through Monday and also happens to be a transitional uh, phase from the summer doldrums to the more active fall trading, or at least in terms of uh, what our seasonality aspects are, we did open up to some remarkable volatility with uh, especially the news uh, related to North Korea, which seems to be a common theme over the past months. Uh, yet the way that we ended the week was extremely different. Uh, where the volatility uh, was pretty heavy uh, in the opening 24 hours, even despite the liquidity drain, uh, we had essentially no action in the, in the next three days, the final three days of the trading week, uh, which ends up uh, giving us an extraordinary drop in activity. Now, I don't think this is you know, a very early signal that, uh, no, these are not going to be uh, active weeks through September and that we're going to once again defy uh, the seasonal uh, historical norms. I still think that these averages are still very likely to take place, uh, but we definitely didn't have that very clear provocative charge. Now, what is noteworthy is that we did through the second half of the week have a significant amount of positive event risk. And that positive event risk included uh, the news that the U.S. debt ceiling is uh, essentially on its way to being resolved for at least three months. So into December as they discuss uh, pushing back the debt ceiling limit to December and funding the government through that same period. And there's also sidebar conversation going on about uh, our uh, regards of completely removing that uh, constant threat to the system. That's a that's very positive, very encouraging, and it removes one of the uh, infrequent but very systemic risks that continue to uh, pr uh, prove a problem to the financial system. Yet we didn't have a really significant advance from the capital markets for risk appetite trends. The same is true of other uh, other uh, developments. The monetary policy views from the ECB this past week helped to balance out expectations. On the one hand, they are confident enough to normalize monetary, uh, monetary policy, but on the other, they are not going to take away the free punch, uh, which speculators are so dependent upon, which is the perfect fine line to walk. We haven't seen protectionism concerns really leveraged. Uh, a lot of the uncertainties that we've been facing recently seem to have at least been temporarily alleviated, yet the markets aren't willing to actually run with it. So the question becomes, what is the driver? Uh, I think that first, there is a, I think we've hit an equilibrium where good news, just any good news, is not enough to just keep lifting us higher. We need something material. We need something to really encourage speculators to build upon their exposure because they are already heavily invested in the uh, risk market. Heavily. Uh, and I keep referring to this because it is just a simple measure of the S&P 500, which is simply the cost to be involved in the market. Uh, and this is a loose, very uh, rudimentary measure of risk reward. Uh, the, again, a 10-year government bond yield aggregate of the G10. So the return component divided by FX space volatility, which is a little bit more uh, global in nature. So return over risk, so risk reward. I don't know why it's reversed in its reference risk reward, but it is. Uh, and it's certainly very uh, divergent. All right, that has been the case for a very long time, but complacency has been so thorough that markets have been willing to continue to push it higher, I think out of necessity than in, uh, anything else. Uh, but w lately, as we've seen, it's not been a ready advance. Now, each time it looked like we were just on the cusp of seeing a significant breakdown on risk-oriented assets. I like to use the S&P 500 because I think it's fundamentally flawed as a uh, risk-leaning asset. And when it breaks, it really is an indication that something is amiss. Uh, but every time we've come to the point where it seems like we're going to start pulling back, uh, it saves itself. But that restraint is there. 
and we need to keep a very close eye on it. We should not be uh, lulled into a false sense of security that complacency has been so consistent and has swooped in and saved the markets each time. Because even though we've uh, alleviated uh, certain concerns or seen them uh, ease, uh, they are not fully gone. There are there's a uh, a range of uncertainties that can arise. Uh, not even the unknowns, the known risks are plentiful. And we are really dealing with complacency in a very high valuation on market prices. Uh, and it's not really the most conducive to keeping uh, all these assets uh, elevated. But what is interesting is that despite the fact that we've turned very, very narrow in the range, little uh, progression, yet we are still just off of record highs. And other global equity indexes are doing relatively well. The DAX is at least taken off the pressure of the descending trend channel. Uh, the FTSE 100 is in a range. The Nikkei 225, eh, it's, it's, it's struggling a little bit, but still within a range. And of, of course, there's no uh, more consistent range than the, uh, uh, the ASX, the Australian index. Um, even emerging markets, high yield fixed income or junk bonds are still holding up relatively well. All right. But that being said, uh, there is so much potential for this to start pulling back. And the at the same time, you have uh, still an elevated sense of risk, of uncertainty, of volatility. The implied volatility measured in the VIX, which has been a frequent uh, barometer uh, over the months and years, uh, is still significantly higher than the 10 threshold that we were uh, just grinding down to over the summer. So clearly, there is a greater sense of uncertainty market activity, uh, despite the fact that you have uh, such inactive actual price action. All right, so and keep that in mind as we move forward into the new week. And do remember that uh, you know the, the term, the, the, the uh, adage that this time can be different is certainly true. We could, we could always uh, undercut the average volatility again. Uh, we can certainly undercut the, uh, the discounted performance through these, the historical average uh, September. Uh, but in the, at the same time, uh, these are averages that uh, are, have proven consistent over time and are statistically relevant. So don't just presume that this time is going to be different just because the previous months have. Uh, there is plenty out there that can cause problems. All right, so risk is definitely going to be at the forefront of concern, uh, and you're not going to get a full-scale reversal uh, in sentiment until we get to more critical levels. So you have to really take off some of the pent-up premium. Uh, so if you want to look at technical terms, you got to you got to complete the right shoulder here on the set and shoulders pattern um, before you actually get to the the serious breaks. Uh, but you can definitely track it out. There are definitely many trade opportunities that, co that come about because of these more moderate moves and sentiment. But looking at the FX side of things, uh, and this also has a very uh, consistent uh, sensitivity to risk trends, uh, but not as of late, uh, the dollar. The dollar has ended this past week with a uh, an un uh, deniable break of support. This is the DXY, the ICE dollar index. Uh, we'll move it up to a weekly chart. Uh, that weekly candle is definitively below that range support that we had over the past two and a half years. All right. Also happens to be a, a very good 38.2 fib of the run from 2011 up to the high of 2017. So we've cleared that f uh, a technical milestone. But does this does this insinuate that we're in the next phase that we have? Uh, ready follow through. Well, again, uh, if you look at some of the other dollar based indexes like the uh, equally weighted Euro USD, Pound USD, Aussie USD, Dollar Yen, so those four most uh, liquid and very uh, different uh, dollar based majors, you can see that that wasn't the case. You did not have the critical break, although you're not far from it. Uh, and I've also showed my own. Um, equally weighted dollar index, I do have it here. Uh, and it isn't even uh, in the vicinity of uh, clearing that previous swing low. All right, so you're close. You're close with the dollar, but you're not showing that degree of conviction. And of course, these are, in essence, uh, a representation of the dollar. 
they are not actually, uh, for the most part, traded instruments. Obviously, the DXY is a different story, but uh, if you look at the actual crosses where we get most of the liquidity, the actual trading in the uh, dollar, we don't really have that critical break with absolute conviction of follow through. The, the best performance obviously comes with uh, the Euro USD, which did close uh, again at a new two and a half year high. But I would remind you that uh, you look on a monthly chart and you see this green, it might be a little bit uh, faint, uh, but it is the midpoint of the Euro's historical range. Remember, the, the Euro only goes back to 1999. So uh, this is the midpoint of that range at 121.35. But nevertheless, actually, let's keep it to the month because we are steadily climbing, all right, for the Euro USD. And we're talking about, well, obviously, we're, we're not even halfway through September, uh, but uh, the number of months that we've climbed here is at the very least comparable uh, or matching, if you will, uh, the, the beginning of 2013, uh, all the way back to 2003. So this is a very impressive run, there's no doubt about that, but don't think this has unrestricted progress because the ECB drive for the euro is really heavily dependent upon speculation. It should risk, aver risk aversion kick in. The very early expectation that the ECB is going to be able to turn a corner on its monetary policy and to value a currency for yield uh, that, I, that remind you is... Uh, getting out of zero, so it's it's we're out of negative territory. It is a negative benchmark. Uh, so you're forward projecting returns that are much further out into the future. All right. So you're in, in essence, this is really the buy the rumor situation, and that is uh, certainly exposed to any kind of uh, downshift in risk appetite. So at this point, uh, well, you, you roll back the clock nine months ago, and the dollar was absolutely a risk-oriented currency. In risk aversion, the dollar would drop. But now, we flipped that. If you recall, we were talking about in 2011, or sorry, 2015, August 2015, when we had that, that very sharp uh, risk aversion move. Actually, let's just show you here. That very sharp decline in risk appetite trends through August 2015, we usually consider the dollar to be the safe haven. It should have rallied in that under those normal circumstances. But as it happened for the euro USD, it actually rose. The dollar declined. It's not because the euro is a safe haven. It's because people had invested in the dollar, long dollar, for a nascent carry appeal, which means it was a very loosely held risk asset. But after this run, who is the risk currency in this pairing? Now it's the euro. So this relationship has flipped. All right, but we have some very uh, influential uh, technical levels ahead, 121, 121.35, very substantial and historical context. Uh, keep a close eye on it. This is the most uh, impressive of the dollar-based moves, although you can make uh, certainly a strong... Uh, case for the dollar CAD in recent uh, price, action, uh, price action in particular, this past week and a half has been exceptional for the Canadian dollar in particular. This is, uh, yeah, the dollar's weakness contributes to this, but it's really the drive behind the Canadian currency, which has been uh, astounding. All right. We are now actually uh, coming up to the midpoint of the 2011 to 2016 range, uh, which is at about well, just shy of 120.50. Uh, so we are just off of that with uh, Friday swing low. Keep an eye on this. That's not going to be a technical boundary that itself can hold back anything. It's really going to depend upon the momentum, the speculative momentum, and the fundamentals that are driving it. Um, but other dollar-based crosses, if you look at, to the Aussie USD, uh, you have new highs, uh, technically, two and a half year, but there's really not a strong conviction there. In fact, there's a large tail, which was a pretty common uh, uh, showing across most of the dollar-based majors. Uh, for the Kiwi USD, same thing, uh, although it's nowhere near its respective high, uh, you would have the... Uh, pound dollar, All right. anti dollar appeal certainly through this week, but uh, not marking the critical progress. More a sterling issue or hold up than a dollar's uh, reticence. But I actually covered this one in the 
uh, in the quick takes video t uh, for the weekend, so you can check that out in detail. Uh, and the dollar yen, this one actually had very good technical progress. We're talking about uh, a new 10 month low, uh, but this, is, does, this does not feel like a break that has uh, just robust momentum that's just lurking behind it. Uh, this is the nature of the dollar, and this is really the nature of general trends. Uh, it's very difficult to find true conviction. The best conviction that one can anticipate at this point is not a, an aggressive buildup in anything. It is a significant deleveraging of existing positions, existing risks, which the dollar certainly is as exposed as anything else to that, uh, but it doesn't really have uh, the circumstances, the, the foundations that suggest that this is uh, a currency or an asset that has just really been stretched too far uh, and is just uh, uh, waiting to be collapsed, not, not like something like equities or high yield uh, assets. So the dollar is at the crux of a lot of what we've seen in, in the progress uh, through this past week. Um, but in the event risk that we are seeing through the coming week, the dollar does not give us the uh, key high capacity event risk. We do have noteworthy data, the small business optimism indicator, the uh, PPI and CPI in, in influences. Uh, that CPI figure is going to be very important because it is essentially the missing ingredient for the Fed to actually hike rates again. Um, so very important in that context, uh, but not really independently market moving. Same is true of the Consumer Confidence Report, the University of Michigan. Uh, we have to watch that. That is very important economically speaking, but it's not a key market mover. This is uh, this is a placeholder week for the dollar because the, in the subsequent week, we have the FOMC rate decision, which everyone will be looking at because that is what we consider to be the quote unquote quarterly Fed decision in which they are not just uh, deliberating a monetary policy, but they also have the updated SEP, Summary of Economic Projections, which they also project to interest rates, uh, as well as Janet Yellen's press conference. All right, so that's that really comprehensive event. Anticipation is very high, uh, but what do you do in the interim? There's going to be restraint. There's going to be a lack of conviction to actually uh, position uh, until that unknown has uh, passed. All right, and that's going to dictate a lot of the activity uh, in these markets. Now, in the meantime, uh, some other currencies may actually find a little bit more substance in their activity. For the uh, for the British pound, uh, uh, as we were looking at with the uh, pound dollar, uh, I, I do like this cross actually quite a bit. And I think moderation is, uh, or the restraint in the markets and the inability to really uh, to pick up and sustain meaningful trends is really the, the driving factor here. But this isn't the only pound cross that I think uh, is really interesting. Now, to be clear, there is a critical event risk on the, the UK docket. Uh, we have UK CPI. We have the Chancellor uh, being questioned at the Lords uh, Committee. Uh, we have the uh, UK employment figures and housing prices. There is a bubble here, as there is in most major uh, countries in the world. Uh, but really, the anticipation is centered on the Bank of England rate decision. But that's anticipation. That means we are going to be focused on this, and we're focusing on this not because we expect anything of the Bank of England. In fact, the markets do not, and economists do not. I do not. Um, but because the ECB speculation has been intense, the Fed speculation has been intense, and the Bank of Canada has actually been active. So that increases the focus on the Bank of England. All right, And that means that anticipation is going to restrain the pound and its ability to actually move uh, substantially, knowing that that uncertainty is in the uh, near uh, background. And subsequently, moves like the pound dollar are not going to be easily sustained and uh, more prone to correction. Uh, the same is true of the euro pound, which uh, was the quick takes video from Friday, which uh, seems to work out at least in the short term uh, appeal or setup that I was talking about. And there are other uh, pound-based crosses, which I think are quite interesting, like the pound Aussie or the pound cat, all right, which are at uh, noteworthy technical levels and subsequently draw quite a, a significant amount of interest to themselves. So I'll be watching these uh, sterling crosses with the knowledge that major event risk is due, but later in the week is the highest profile uh, release. Now, since we're talking about the pound cad here, uh, it certainly is worth talking about the Canadian dollar. The Canadian dollar 
didn't actually st uh, find f strong follow through th through the final session of this past week, which is remarkable because the Canadian dollar has done so well uh, f just prior to that, preceding that. Uh, you look at all these Aussie, or sorry, all these these loony based crosses: Aussie CAD, uh, the Kiwi CAD. All right, the CAD yen, which was actually the preferred trade uh, that I've uh, gone with, but you look at all these and they've done so well, and yet at the last stage uh, it starts to fall apart. Uh, obviously, this had a little bit to do with the data and a little bit to do with the markets being very heavily skewed or slanted towards a bullish position and a need to uh, pull back a little bit. The data that we had on tap was very noteworthy and very capable of generating volatility like we talked about, uh, and indeed it did generate volatility. The unemployment rate ticked down. The net payrolls uh, actually climbed by a significant 22,200 jobs the details though that was all due to short-term jobs in fact there was a 88,100 job loss on full-time positions which is not an encouraging uh, development now does this meaningfully change the the motivation for the Canadian dollar that we've seen over the past weeks and months uh, in other words is this really uh, subvert the Bank of Canada's efforts into the future. Uh, it can move the dial modestly, but I don't think that it's going to be the ultimate uh, deciding factor. Really, the, the deciding factor is inflation, uh, which this does not touch upon. Um, but we'll see how much of this has been just pure uh, speculative buildup uh, and how many traders that were bullish loony are going to start pulling back and taking profit because all they wanted was momentum and they didn't want to have to trace out a perfect fundamental future uh, which obviously starts to erode with this kind of view uh, but the the, K, the dollar CAD, the CAD yen, uh, the pound CAD, all of these are very remarkable. Uh, they have great high profile technicals. Uh, so look for the combination of fundamentals and technicals and always uh, including those market conditions. Now, the currency that has been most remarkable, and it flew under my radar until the second half of the week, uh, the Chinese Yuan, uh, its final session of this past week was a very wide range, uh, though ultimately positive uh, day. But when you look at the performance of this move, it's just extraordinary. We had 14 trading days uh, to the downside up until the Monday session. After that, we had some moderation. But that is uh, a multi-year uh, record. Uh, when we look at the performance of just the two weeks, so a 10-day rate of change, uh, this was the worst two-week performance that we've seen uh, going back uh, for the record on the offshore renminbi, uh, which, or sorry, the onshore renminbi, which is uh, CNH. Um, but when you actually look at the CNY, which is the onshore, uh, has all the historical, uh, this is actually the biggest decline going back to 1984. And you have to remember that Prior to approximately four years ago, this was a heavily, well, more heavily than we are now, uh, manipulated exchange rate with big moves to the upside and downside. And yet this is still the biggest two-week drop that we've seen in 30-plus years. So that's quite remarkable. And we have to remember on October the 18th, we do have uh, the uh, the government Congress coming together and, and projecting their five-year plan, uh, very important, and they often look to stabilize financial markets and exchange rates uh, heading into that. So it's remarkable that they're allowing it to move this rapidly, uh, perhaps in response to uh, the protectionism calls and, uh, and claims of major trade partners, namely the United States. Uh, but it's also worth noting that uh, sister currency, the Hong Kong dollar, uh, had a massive uh, two-day session uh, through this past week, Thursday and Friday, which this only tallies up to 0.4%. But 0.4% per, uh, is actually quite remarkable when, you're, when you consider that the Hong Kong dollar actually has a peg to the U.S. dollar. as a peg with a tolerance band. The peg is down here at 775, and the tolerance band is, uh, well, the extremes are up to 7.83, which we've actually seen it come very close to, and I was 
Uh, if you recall, I, I was very surprised that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority didn't step in, all, ha having already seen the currency pair hit those extremes before, uh, but they definitely let loose uh, in the Thursday-Friday session. Uh, now, this tail is quite remarkable. Uh, we'll have to see what kind of spillover this has, uh, the motivations, the plans, the strategy. We don't know. Uh, they don't tell us, um, but there's also the complication of uh, working not just the Hong Kong policy of a, a fixed exchange rate, uh, but there's also the consideration that they are a funnel for capital for mainland China, and mainland China theoretically has a market-determined exchange rate. So it creates a lot more complication uh, when they're trying to pull the levers to keep everything stable. Financial conditions, which there's arguably a significant uh, capital bubble in, in, in China, uh, and economic stability, uh, not to mention the slow progress towards an open market. So keep an eye on this. In the cryptocurrency world, uh, Bitcoin uh, finished off the week with a significant tumble, as did Ethereum and Ripple and Litecoin and all the other uh, ICOs or cryptocurrencies. Their decline came despite uh, at least some positive news that uh, Russia had reversed course and previously they said they would jail uh, those that actually dealt in ICOs uh, and they instead went the other way. They suggested they're going to regulate it, uh, which is encouraging and it, it does suggest that there is traction here for uh, these cryptocurrencies. But the concern that really seems to continue to weigh on the markets is uh, China's decision to ban and South Korea's decision to heavily regulate. Uh, these were two regions where we had seen a lot of uh, the uh, use of these digital currencies had boomed in recent months, so their restrictions uh, and being taken offline are uh, going to carry a substantial influence here because there's a lot of speculative interest in this asset. Eventually it will really integrate itself, and I'm not saying Bitcoin is particularly, but blockchain technology will eventually find its way into the financial system and clearing uh, capacity, but in the meantime it is still heavily speculative. All right, these are the millennial angel investors coming into an early uh, change in the financial structure of the global uh, global markets. But there was a lot of risk in being a first uh, adopter on these types of circumstances. Uh, and there's a lot of volatility that comes in the initial growth phase of assets like this. So you have to expect volatility, and we are getting plenty of it. And finally, commodities. With the dollar's uh, initial decline and subsequent rebound, gold would do the mirror or the opposite. Uh, we temporarily jumped above 1350, but we essentially held uh, back from a close above there. Now, I would loosely suggest that there's a possibility that this can be a trend line, but it does not stand as a trend line in my book. I emphasize, I think you need at least three points on a trend line, confirmed points, before you could actually call it a trend line, because any two points in space can make a line, but it doesn't make it a significant line. If this holds and we have a pullback, that ends up a trend line. But until we do, this is just a floating level in space that has perhaps some relevance to some people, not to me. All right, uh, but. Gold is the asset that people look to when they think that the world's most liquid currencies are essentially dropping in tandem, which you don't necessarily see in a relative market because the dollar or the euro, if those were the only two currencies, as one drops, one has to rise. But it doesn't mean that they're all, both appealing. They can both lose value to other alternatives to fiat, and gold is one of the primary. Uh, so keeping an eye on this, and if you really think this is going to take off, you have to have some kind of measure of expectation that the collective currencies of the world are going to depreciate. All right, and finally, oil. If the, the ASX 200, which is the Australian index, is arguably the best uh, and most consistent range that we currently have, but this is a close contender because you can see that there is a nice trend line here, uh, and generally oil has been holding up to this range, and it did another range swing. And there's a lot of activity going on here with the supply-demand questions. Obviously, you have the constant supply glut, but then you have uh, the very active hurricane season in, that's uh, shaping up in the United States and the uh, southeast uh, and really roiling the activity down in the Gulf Coast area, um, but it does not seem to uh, be enough to break this commodity out of its congestion.
right? That's just really remarkable uh, that the supply demand factors have at one point been the driving force, but now they are uh, faltering to complacency like most other assets. All right, these are market conditions and it's important to watch. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next uh, rundown of these markets next week. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there and I hope you have a fantastic weekend.